Good evening and welcome to the square. Tonight is a very timely discussion. We are going to focus on philanthropy and volunteerism in Rwanda. Specifically, we are going to be looking at the work Imbuto Foundation does, as well as a local NGO known as Rwanda We Want, in terms of serving communities over the years. And I'll start by introducing our guests. Uh, with us we have, from Imbuto Foundation, representing Imbuto Foundation tonight, is Sandrine Umutuni, who is the Director General. Sandrine, it's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, also joining us is Tristan Murenzi, who is the chairperson as well as one of the founding members of Rwanda We Want. Tristan, it's great to have you on the square tonight. Thank you for having me. Great. My name is LMPC, host of The Square. As always, I'm joined by the, the Square resident panelist. And on my left, I'll start by introducing Brenna Namata. Brenna, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Dan. Uh, also joining us, as always, is Charles Halva. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Same here, Dana. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, before we kick off, we usually have midweek highlights from the Square Resident panelists, uh, things that have caught your attention thus far in the week. Charles, uh, I always like starting with you because <laughs> I know you have very interesting uh, midweek highlights. Um, anything you'd like to share? No, I think one, one of the things that caught my attention in the last seven days was um, the, the, the reverse of what we had discussed. Because the uh, 40 kilometers per hour, and a bit, it was a it was a major concern. Uh, but again, it's quite relevant that we're talking about the Rwanda that we want. We want a Rwanda that listens, or the Rwanda that has leadership that listens to its people. Yes. Uh, I don't know where I would have been without the motaris and, and, and them being listened to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I think that was the highlight of my last seven days. That. Um, that uh, uh, resonance prevailed. Mm -hmm. Yes. True. True, true, true. Midweek highlights, Brenna? Just must stay safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this week, we, we are beginning the 16 days of activism against um, GBV. Um, it's still a big problem. We hope uh, that as we because it's been going on for many years and it just seems like it just starts it's a campaign and ends but you still see cases of uh, gbv going up so i hope that uh, we'll come to a time when we will be talking about uh, 16 days of activism but actually saying it's no longer you know a problem mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately we know that uh, during the pandemic it's gotten worse uh, women uh, many women have been victims of GBV, so let us all try and do whatever we can uh, to protect women and uh, find ways of uh, resolving differences without uh, beating or harassing. harassing Absolutely, yep. I agree. Um, I'd like us to go now to our guests. Um, it's a very important conversation. I think it's the first time we're having this sort of conversation in mm. our four-year history on the yeah. show. Usually, you know, it's hard-hitting uh, topics and, and that sort of thing. But I think it's very important to also look at how um, various organizations or youth-based initiatives serve, uh, are in service of communities. And I'll start with Imbuto Foundation. And this question goes directly to you, Sandrine. Um, you know, this year marks 20 years of Imbuto Foundation in service to communities, engaging, empowering, and educating. Um, Follow-up questions to this, but just for the benefit of our viewers, those in Rwanda and those out of Rwanda, if you could start by giving us a brief history. What are the origins of Imbuto Foundation, especially on this auspicious occasion where it's, it, it's marking 20 years this year in terms of service to communities? Thanks, Diana. So, as it's called Protection and Care for Families Against HIV AIDS or PACFA. So, if you go back in time 20 years ago, that has so many different priorities and one of them being the HIV AIDS crisis. So the first lady with a team of very dedicated women went to work and decided to tackle the HIV AIDS crisis through the, the, the mothers who were pregnant. 
And the idea behind that was to make sure that, yes, the mother may have been infected with HIV AIDS, but we didn't want their children to be born with the disease. And that is how Imbuto actually started 20 years ago. We were looking at the prevention of mother-to-child transmission of the HIV virus. And over time, as um, the First Lady and her team was actually looking at um, the, the entire country, the entire ecosystem, it became more and more evident that uh, focusing on just the crisis was actually missing the bigger picture. And that is how new projects were being added. Uh, for instance, we have stories at the office where uh, the First Lady was asking the team to look at the, the rest of the family. So yes, we've been catering to the mother who was infected with HIV AIDS, making sure she could have access to the right ARV treatment, that she could be enrolled under Mutuel de Santé. Um, but then now we're picturing the other family members, so that young child who's growing up, what will be their needs? The other siblings in the home, what adding education programs, um, looking at, again, scholarship programs. And today we have over 10,000 beneficiaries uh, who've been able to complete the secondary education thanks uh, to the, gener uh, the generosity of different don donors, including companies, individuals. Uh, we were also looking at the question of uh, girls' education. And uh, the First Lady actually started a campaign in 2005 called Promotion of Girls' Education, where she will go around the country, all 30 districts, recognizing what we call the best performing girls as a way to encourage the community to support girls' excellence in school. So you're really picturing um, um, an initiative that started out of the prevention of the transfer or the transmission of the virus from the mother to the child to now looking at the entire family. So Imbuto, as the name, was actually born in 2007 as we were now looking at a more holistic approach, or I should say integrated approach to make sure that all the different family members of this family could actually be taken care of and taken to the next stage in their life. So now fast forward 20 years later, we have programs in uh, education, in health, youth and women economic empowerment. And from again, that we are looking at beneficiaries all around the country. We are looking at young people who are supported for the education who are now occupying a high level position, whether in the public sector or the private sector. We are looking at young people uh, again, if you imagine that baby who was born free of HIV AIDS was now going through um, teenage years, adulthood, and we want to make sure they don't encounter HIV AIDS later in life. So we have now the introduction of sexual and productive health programs. So we make sure that the generations, the next generations of Rwanda are free of disease, understand how their bodies work, but ultimately are empowered to make the right decisions for themselves. And last but not least, because Imbuto Foundation um, aligns with the priorities of the government, we want to make sure that we always stay within a framework that actually makes sense for the community. So we align with NST, we align with the Agenda 2063 for the Africa we want, we also align with the SDGs. or as well through Imbuto. I can mention some of the health needs, the education needs, but we're also looking at the youth empowerment through creation of employment. And this is actually done through uh, the creativity, because we believe that there's great talent in Rwanda. We believe that the talents need to be nurtured and talents can actually take these young people to the next step in their lives as well. So 20 years being celebrated this Saturday actually uh, through a gala dinner is a moment for us to look back at the beginning that Imbuto, the seed that was planted and picturing the future. We want to know exactly where the beneficiaries are, and that's why we are now calling on social media um, for a challenge called Faces of Imbuto, where we're asking anybody around the country who has been part of the Imbuto Foundation journey uh, to share Uh, very important journey that they are sharing with us. We use it as an inspiration for the next 20, 30, 50 years as we believe that we are just getting started with Fembuto. There's so much more to see.
Thank you. Thank you, Sandrine. Um, just a quick follow-up question. Um, you know, I, I like that you said we're just getting started and it's been two decades. Uh, my question really is, um, you know, we, I, I, I have the numbers with me, but, you know, you've mentioned some of them. Um, you know, over 15,000 youth-empowered um, three-year youth programs, uh, over 10,000 um, scholarships given to um, secondary school students uh, around the country and so forth and so on. Um, over 30,000 um, families, uh, children and families enrolled in a uh, model and home-based um, early child development um, uh, centers. You know, uh, these are just very compelling numbers. My question to you is, um, on behalf of Imbuto, I know it's a team, I know it's, it's the leadership, but what is the sort of ingredient, what is the secret ingredient to some of the you know, really extensive and impactful work the foundation has done in the last two decades that you can share with us, maybe for other like-minded institutions that want to learn or for people who just really want to understand what has been the key ingredients in uh, enabling the foundation to do the work that it's been doing so far. Um, I would say that one of, well, actually the strongest ingredients in this entire recipe, making sure that seeds can be planted and grow, is the belief, the strong belief that we deserve better. Uh, as a country, we deserve better as a community, and if we should not be stopped from getting an education they want to just because they can't afford to. So this drive to really realize the potential of uh, our, our fellow citizen is really at the bottom of everything that has been going on at Imbuto Foundation. So I want to say it's one of the strongest uh, ingredients that we have, really believing in the human capital development of uh, fellow citizens and really going to work and not being shy about what is possible for Rwanda. Um, again, we come from a very dark history. Um, so again, if we go back into history 20 years ago, it was, uh, it was not what we're seeing today in, in Rwanda. So I think it took a lot of uh, courage on the part of uh, the team that began uh, PACFA and Imbuto Foundation to say, you know what, this is what we're seeing now, but we know there's much more uh, behind what we're experiencing. And because we really believe that there's much more to be accomplished, that our people do deserve better. And once you are giving them the tools to empower themselves, then they really take off and create something much more you know, impactful for themselves. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Sandrine. I'd like to hear from Charles and Berna. Um that there's someone who can support the family, that means so much. Um, also, when we look at the, their evolution into creating opportunities for the youth, targeting for the youth, uh, again, it's a big problem across Africa, uh, creating opportunities for the youth. Um, if you're not targeting the youth, uh, then who are you targeting? Because the youth are the majority of our population. So it's good to see, and again, ideas outside the box. Uh, if, if you followed uh, art, uh, the, art, the art and creative uh, program, it's actually targeting everyone. Because typically what we've seen most of the time, it's kind of obvious, yeah? But when you see the talent that they are showcasing, uh, I don't know if you've been to their, they have a shop at uh, your building, what is it called? KBC? Maybe. Former KBC? You know you can't in singular. Yeah, and yeah. look at what's happening there. You the know, certain uh, of the building and there Yes, you know, clothing, art pieces, and, and these are done by, you know, um, young people. Mm. And that is where the future is. Uh, we know that uh, formal education does not necessarily create employment opportunities, you know. And the more we have uh, vocational uh, training, it actually helps us to move faster in terms of addressing uh, unemployment. Mm -hmm. So they've got their heart in the right place, you know. Uh, I think what we need going forward is how do you scale up that? Mm -hmm. uh, we need to see the private sector, for instance, coming in and doing more. Um, I haven't looked at their funding structure, 
uh, and I was, as she was speaking, I was thinking about when she mentioned the gala dinner on, on Saturday and I haven't seen um, a campaign around if you want to meet the first lady, you could, you could pay maybe 100,000 to attend. Twenty years, I would be fundraising. I know it's been a pandemic, it's difficult, but fundraising from the beginning of the year till I, I don't know. Um, again, it's a pandemic, so probably it's, it's difficult. Uh, but we need to appreciate uh, what they're doing and amplify that, mm. uh, especially the private sector. We still have, you know, uh, our private sector is still lagging behind in terms of uh, philanthropy, mm. and you know. If we are to look at uh, also the definition of philanthropy, because we are moving from just charity to philanthropy, which means creating opportunities, you know. So can we start thinking about how we can amplify their work um, and not just see it um, as an initiative that um, has already done enough, but how do we support them to even do more and reach more yeah more people and also be uh, sustainable yeah yeah so part of sustainability is getting um the private sector to get involved and in, in, in support them absolutely um my other follow-up question and, and you hit it right on the on the nail on the head right now is to do with um the private sector how Mbuto foundation you know works with the private sector in some of the work it does so we'll definitely come back to that sandrine um but before we do i'd like to hear from charles thanks uh, dan i think it's extremely important to, to tell the Rwandan story and um, to say that uh, every effort has mattered along our recovery journey. When the world giving credit where it's due to Sandrine and her team and her predecessors and everybody who has seen them come along the way, um, you, 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 you quite often hear very disturbing stories. Well, main be, it's disturbing in the run and context of first ladies of other countries who spend all their time in Paris shopping and wearing the most, <laughs> most expensive diamond and accumulating uh, millions of pairs of shoes. Mm. Uh, but for them, for the first lady to have put together a team of people, and I know Diana have been involved in that as well, and very many other people that we know, to, to create an impact. To realize that that there are organs and institutions and policies in place through which we are going to rebuild this country, but those are not enough, and any other hand, any other idea is very welcome. It's extremely important, yeah. and, and and I think that's where the credit is really due. That uh, that I, 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 in what. Children, the, 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 the parents, I mean, Sandrine is giving us an amazing parents who are affected by HIV and AIDS and I can imagine those days the access to drugs was a huge problem uh, or, or kids would be written off because their parents or because they have been born from parents who, who, who have HIV AIDS. So. Uh, uh, Mine is really, uh, I'll come in a little bit later in terms of, 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 of the Rwanda that we want, but mine is really to give credit to where it's due and at the risk of repeating myself to say that uh, any effort, and this was probably the most top efforts, and you can imagine at that time the resources we even had were very meager, but the effort uh, uh, that, they, that, that was put in uh, at, at a very, very decently high level was, was uh, extremely welcome and it's, it's, it's humbling to see the fruits. Absolutely. Yeah. I like the word play on the fruits. Yeah. Uh, the yes. Seeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, um, I'd like to go to Tristan, but Sandrine, if you could also just hold some of your responses, you know, especially when it comes to the private sector uh, and that sort of thing. Um, I'd like to go to Tristan. Uh, Tristan is a young gentleman here. Um, I, I read some of um, what he has done and it's quite impressive. And uh, Tristan, my question is to you regarding the initiative. Um, got together with the idea to create a club to discuss, discuss leadership um, values, um, amongst other things. If you could just also start by telling us a bit more about the 
inspiration and origins of this organization that you could find? We started Rwanda Want. It wasn't meant to become an organization one day, but uh, to be a club whereby young people would meet to discuss. And actually, the idea came from a random discussion during lunchtime in high school. Uh, I was 17 at the time, and my peers were almost the same age. And they were having a random discussion about the development journey of our country, uh, the economic development of our country, but most importantly, the connection between this development journey and the leadership of Rwanda at the forefront, uh, of course, the President of the Republic. And we're wondering what could be our role as students, as high school students, as young people? What could be our role in, in the continuity of this development process? What could be our role uh, as, uh, as young people born after the genocide? And then we thought about why can't we create a club whereby in our free times we would meet and, uh, and discuss more, but in a more organized manner about these subjects we were talking about during last time. And, uh, and of course invite uh, uh, people with more experience to talk to us about you know, the development journey of Rwanda, the leadership values and everything. But most importantly, uh, what was at the core of this discussion and what, has, what was at the core of these leadership values that we were discussing about was unity and reconciliation. Because actually Rwanda is not a country like any other. Rwanda is a country that has witnessed the genocide against the Tutsis in 1994. So, and we were the, the first generation born after that genocide. So we could not just talk about leadership like other young people from other countries would talk about it, but would talk about it having unity and reconciliation at the core of, of, the, of the discussion we'll be having. So actually, we would use all the free time we had to, to, to have this kind of discussions. And actually, it started to be, we started, uh, the, the discussions started to be fruitful, and then other young people from school started joining, and then the club became bigger. And then it got to an extent that where the entire school would come and discuss, and, and then every student would be like, this is the role I think I could play in, play in the Rwanda one. This is, this is the role I think I could play in the continuity. This is the role I think I could play in the, in the development journey of my country. So actually, after that, we graduated from high school. And then we, we thought about, why can't we bring this club to other schools in Rwanda, to other schools in the, in the district? And then we couldn't just take a club and take it somewhere else without being registered. So that's how we registered it as an organization that would be coordinating the clubs in the schools. So that's more of it of uh, where everything came from. And then you may wonder where the name came from. So actually, the name came from a bigger, a bigger context. It came from the Africa we want. Rwanda had hosted the, uh, the AFDB general meetings here in Kigali, and then they were discussing about the Africa we want, the Agenda 2063. And I remember His Excellency the President, uh, Paul Kagame, saying that if we need to achieve the, run, uh, the, sorry, the Africa we want, we would need to urgently invest in young people, invest in their knowledge, invest in their, in, in their capacity building. So I thought, why can't we have the run that we want. Why can't it? Uh, why can't it? Why can't we give it uh, the name of run that we want? We want? Uh, trying to be like, if you want to have the Africa you want, it will start by the run that you want uh, with young people. So I think that's uh, more of it. Thank you, um, and Tristan. Just before we go to the next um, uh, elements of the show, um, my question to you is: What can? What advice can you give young people, youth, in terms of you know, um, really? pushing and, and promoting the spirit of volunteerism because you know it's it's giving without expecting it's being involved it's not being apathetic it's being uh, really aware of what your country needs and willing to to serve so you've been doing this for quite a while I mean you know you said you're in high school I, I take it you finished high school and probably university <laughs> um, but you know you're, you're youth you're still young and um, you know what are some What's some advice you can give young people listening in terms of the spirit of volunteerism, uh, citing some examples of some tangible projects that um, Rwanda We Want has done so far? Well, I, I think I will answer this question um, with, um, with examples from our programs. So actually, when we talk about volunteerism, I hear serving the community. I hear serving the community without expecting uh, rewards, but just expecting the community to be better. 
uh, and it's a spirit that helps young people to be problem solvers instead of just you know being people who always ask questions but and, and, and who always point out these are the challenges but then who are problem solvers to these challenges actually um, the, the the advice I'll be giving to young people is to is to is to join volunteerism activities because one it will impact the community but it will also help you grow either professionally mentally it will, it will really uh, help you actually when Rwanda once started we were all volunteers and actually all the programs we had because actually uh, all the programs Rwanda want had didn't have any donor for the Actually, we had our first donor in 2019 while we started in 2015. So we were volunteering all that time. So I think the, 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 the good thing about volunteering is that you're building your network, you're building your experience so that whenever someone wants to, to partner with you, they will see that you already have the experience. And you cannot build that experience without first volunteering. Because, you know, when partners are coming or donors or anyone else or even the government, they would first ask you, what did you do before we come? So mm -hmm. I think. I would advise young people to first start using the, their ideas, using their, you know, their thinking to be able to, 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 to start. Because um, I, I will, I will, I will, uh, you will allow me to, 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 to talk about some of our programs and how they started. Actually, we started with um, empowerment, youth empowerment. Then we'd have discussions with, uh, with young people about, I mean, what do I want to do in the future? And, and we would actually have mentors to talk about uh, what they have achieved and everything and, and inspire the young people. And then later, uh, just uh, in 2021, we have now got the, the, the funding from the Embassy of Israel in Rwanda to, to, to put in place a mentorship hub. You know, we have started uh, empowering young people without even having a hub where we would be empowering them. We would just find them in schools or other places, and now we're going to have a hub because we have started. So it's always good to start by volunteering, and then later partners will, will, will join you, philanthropists will join you, and then continue the journey. And you also uh, have um, this program in line with the youth, uh, youth section and productive health, whereby, you know, would be uh, talking to, to our colleagues about you know, SRH and about what is involved in SRH. I mean, what should we know as young people about SRH? But then, as well, we're doing volunteering. We didn't have any partner to support that. And then later in 2019, we got a support from the USA doing of the activity, whereby we're only working in one district in Gatsibo. But uh, this year, we have launched it in two more districts, in Nyanza and, uh, and, um, and, 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 and Goma in Goma district, I mean, to show young people that you just have to start and then people will join you later. Mm. And then we also have this program uh, in line with uh, unity and memory that I was talking about in the first place, ab about that we are in a country that has witnessed a genocide. So we cannot talk about all of this without talking about unity, memory, and reconciliation because it is at the core of, of our, even our existence. So we started organizing, we organized the very first Ndumunya Rwanda conference in 20, 18, where we had uh, requested for the school to give us a big, a big room for bringing in young people. We didn't have anyone to support the program. But then later, in uh, 2019, the, the, the National Unity and Reconciliation Commission, the then National Unity and Reconciliation Commission, joined us and was like, how can we support you? How can we continue to work with you on this program? So in a way, the government has supported us because we had already started. And then we, we even started uh, having intergenerational dialogues about our history in Wujesera, and then later a partner called Interpeace has joined us to, 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 to support us in the journey. And then actually, next week on Saturday, we'll be even launching the very first uh, program of Rwanda I Want uh, in the diaspora. We are, we are launching our first uh, program whereby young uh, will we'll be uh, talking about the role of young Rwandans living abroad in national unity. And you have been supported by our Ministry of Foreign Affairs with our embassy there in France. Actually, the program will be uh, launched in Rome. But actually, the, the government or any other partners that has uh, partnered with us has partnered with us because they have seen that we have started. So my advice to young people, start and then people will join you because we are in a country that supports young people Actually, I always tell people that uh, it's always good
to be young in Rwanda. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Tristan. Um, I really like the passion with which you speak especially as a young person, really dedicated to contributing to, you know, to Rwanda's development. And yeah, I can agree with you uh, more. You know, you start and people will come. You start and people will join your journey because of what you've done so far. Um, Charles, I know we started the show and you said you, you're really looking forward to hearing from Tristan. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on what he shared? No, I, you know, as he, as he kept speaking, I just wondered, is there anyone in this world who's not a volunteer? Mm. You, know, you look at... Our mothers, our parents volunteered to, one parent would stay home, another one is looking after you. Uh, you've been a boy scout or a girl guide. Uh, you will serve at your friend's wedding. Mm. <laughs> you know, you, you, there, there is this whole spirit of volunteerism. I think Tristan should not try to paint an extremely <laughs> rosy picture because we have all been volunteers and we continue to be volunteers in one way or another. Not to downplay uh, uh, his, his amazing initiative, but just to challenge um, such initiatives and th th that are in place, that we need to think about it a notch higher to, 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 to improve uh, uh, the status quo. Um, Sandrine, where she sits with her Imbuto Foundation, she didn't want to, the hundreds of thousands, I think it's 15,000, families or so, if I remember the statistics well, stand to be corrected. You don't want them to come onto the labor market and there are things that they will meet that are not well, like, for example, surprise regulation on how quickly you can walk. Or <laughs> you don't want them to be part of... Did you guys know that, uh, for instance, I don't know any single government institution that can respond to a letter on time? So you don't want them to come out and either be part of that inefficient uh, uh, mechanism that is there in, in, in public service. You, 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 you don't want them to come to, 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 to be part of, uh, of uh, a system that, that, that is unfair to say, I mean, earlier on I saw quite a bit of, uh, of media banter around the media bar barometer that was launched by Rwanda Governance Board. So you, you, you want these youth to come in and create a difference. Yes, they may not get in and, and, and be in positions of influence where they can immediately change the status quo, but you want them to come and we stop crying that Amavu, we have no results, mm. right? So we, 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 we want... Uh, 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 youth that are coming onto the market and creating change. They will come and find their elders, their uncles, aunties and parents who are in place, but I, I like it that Tristan says that this government has empowered the youth and has put them in position of responsibility and, and has given them the tools. They need to use those tools. That's my point, Diana. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, th there's a point you mentioned. I, I, I'll, I'll try and pick up on it uh, later, but uh, but just to clarify, you, you, you know, based on what Sandrine and, and, um, and Tristan have shared, um, your submission is that, 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 that young people should be challenged to take um, volunteerism yes. up a notch higher. Uh, to, to, so there are two points, really. To take volunteerism a notch higher, but take full advantage of the opportunities they have been given to create change and not go with the status quo. Mm. Yeah, for us who are... Who are phasing out of the youth uh, uh, bracket, yeah. we, we, we are not too happy that we, 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 we this, the, the status quo. Have we changed anything? Probably yes, probably not. Mm. Did we find it the way it is? Probably yes, probably not. Do we want it better for our children? Definitely yes. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Uh, Brenna, I know, um, you know I, I would like to ask you this, but um, you know, we've had conversations, um, you know, when we were setting up this show last week, uh, talking about volunteerism. Um, you know, we are focusing on youth, but I remember you saying something very, um, very, you know, it stuck with me. You know, we have senior citizens, people who are in retirement, people who have a lot of wisdom, gems of wisdom to share. And, you know, how can we, and this is just the idea, because I know this is something you've talked about, how can we tap into young people? You know, you know my, my dad, for instance, is in his retirement, he runs his business, but I'm sure he'd be very happy to come and talk to young people. How do we tap into sort of senior citizens in the sort of retirement phase and engage them in the spirit of volunteerism, also working with young people? Yeah, um, I haven't formed the policy framework for volunteering in Rwanda. 
I don't know if it's anywhere. Mm -hmm. I just tried and I, I couldn't find it. So apologies if I've missed it. But we need one. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that um, if you look at uh, the changes to the pension law, you know, uh, changes to the pension law but also our history, we actually have many, and the number is increasing, of people who get into early retirement. There's also another issue of randoms living longer because of life expectancy. So when someone is 50 and above, you don't want them to really feel that their options in life are limited. It is very unfair. So if we have policy that creates opportunities to say, um, when you're getting to 50, 55, and, still or young. even 60, <laughs> yes. I, I mean, we, we do have actually people yeah. that are laid off, forced into retirement, mm -hmm. even before they are 60 plus. Mm -hmm. We do have them. It's you know. called early retirement. Yes, and, and, so, and, and so far I think I only know about the army mm -hmm. that integrates uh, under the reserve force. Um, but how do we create that, replicate that in other sectors? You know, uh, for instance, in the medical world, you know, um, you have uh, nurses that retire but could still have some, uh, be given hours, you know, come in, do your two hours or, or you know, one, just to keep them, you know, productive and, and link them with, with young people, you know. So I feel that we need to kind of rethink uh, volunteering, uh, take it beyond the youth. It is good what the youth are doing, uh, that there are opportunities there, but also how you address duplication of effort. You know, uh, there's also that risk, especially among uh, the youth, that um, someone will jump onto an idea because it, you know, probably the Ministry of, of, of Unity and Youth will pick it up. You know, so you have many, for instance, uh, NGOs around reconciliation, unity, but, and, but then that creates some bit of confusion, you know. So how do you deal with duplication of effort? Mm. You know, if we know that uh, Imbuto is, is focusing on, on, on the family, uh, it has priority sectors, how do we instead amplify what Imbuto is doing instead of just creating other small, you know, uh, copying what they're trying to do, and then you create um, duplication of effort that in the end may undermine what they're doing. Mm -hmm. My final submission would be also, uh, he talks about uh, government and some private sector, but I would want that they focus purely their efforts on mobilizing support from the private sector, you know, uh, for whatever initiatives that they are trying to do, because that is what is sustainable. Um, the government support is there, but how do you take it beyond, you know, the idea that uh, um, Charles is talking about? How do you create a critical mass of young people that are focused on solving, one, social problems using business, for instance? Uh, there's a young woman uh, currently in the water business um, I think we had out the square before. Yes, Christelle. Look at what Christelle is, is doing. She is for profit, doing amazing work. Mm. You know. So thinking outside the box, uh, getting young people really thinking hard about solving social problems, you know, and looking at it as a business opportunity, not just for charity, mm. if I may use that word. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to go to Sandrine. Um, I think you have a lot to respond, uh, but if you could just kick off by responding um, with the main focus, um, you know, from Charles and Brenner, the, the main question is how does Imbuto work, you know, with the private sector? Um, you know, what are pipeline plans? What are, you know, past or current plans? Uh, and the same question I will ask also to Tristan, looking forward on how Rwanda We Want can engage with the private sector um, to solve some of the social issues that it works towards. Uh, but yeah, I'll kick off with you, Sandrine. All right, that's a very loaded question. Uh, when, when Imbuto started, we actually began with the support of the government of Rwanda, international development partners, 
Currently, we are working heavily with private foundations that are both on the continent, in America and in Europe. Uh, but as the Imbuto Foundation is growing and now looking at a new strategic vision, which is uh, really strengthening the financial independence of uh, the foundation, we have also looked at the recent legislation that have been approved at random level, including um, the, the laws basically linked to the, the philanthropies, the laws of uh, trust funds in Rwanda, as now we are really building the ecosystem in Rwanda to allow all those structures to be more efficient. Uh, and as such, Imbuto Foundation is actually launching a trust fund because, again, the idea behind it is it is great to work with different partners who are like-minded, but at the end of the day, there are some priorities that are very pertinent to the Rwandan communities that not every partner will be able to understand. And it will be very unfortunate to have to move from one cause to another because funding has run out. Mm. So with the trust fund, what we are hoping to get actually is more financial independence in the causes that we support, but also in uh, the support that we want to bring to other community-based organizations that work in the community. Um, and here maybe I can actually like, go back to what Tristan was saying just a few minutes ago when he gave the example of Ndumunyar Gwanda. Um, th this is really a strong philosophy that I, I want to equate it to philanthropy in general, where you have the love of people, literally what philanthropy means, with Ndumunyar Rwanda, where we are saying that this was the philosophy that really drove the liberation struggle of Rwanda, saying, let's forget this whole ethnicity, um, I'm from this side or that side, I, bottom line is Ndumunyar Rwanda. So to see uh, younger organizations like Rwanda We Want pick up on that philosophy that was really you know, encouraged by the liberation struggle um, and then seeing it you know, adopted by uh, Rwanda We Want and now you know, given another form again to the, the, the younger generation is something that really resonates with us. So when we see um, how other organizations are evolving around us, again, growing from a philosophy that was started 20 and plus years before our time, uh, we are saying that there's something very crucial happening here in Rwanda. Again, it's the strengthening of the community-based organization, um, but also understanding that there is a private sector, and private sector have a very important role to play in philanthropy. They have an important role to play because, again, if we just think in terms of mathematics, they are hiring people coming from the community. So it is also in the best interest to hire people who have been going through the best programs possible so that they hire an individual, an employee, who has the right mindset, an employee who's healthy, an employee who's also able to come up with innovations that will take the company to the next level. Mm. So we are really calling on more involvement uh, of the private sector to support these different causes because, again, they don't exist outside of the Rwandan framework. They are part of it. and. Um, uh, at the end of the day, again, who, who wants to evolve in an environment where things are not stable, that your employees hire today and then they have to leave the next day because they don't have the sense of commitment. Um, so again, it's really a call to the private sector to look into all these laws that are being made available at the, at the government level, whether through philanthropies or trust funds, because Yes, I understand they are businesses, so there will also be a return on investment on their parts. And with, again, the love of people and philanthropy, they will also be able to contribute to a stronger community that's, again, going to benefit uh, uh, their companies uh, in the long term. Um, so maybe to just wrap up that idea is we really believe that we are all part of the same ecosystem. The, the government makes the policies possible, they protect uh, the citizen. The role of the civil society is to identify some key issues around the community, but also be um, aware enough to understand, as I believe it was Berna who just mentioned that, the issue of duplication of efforts. Um, if he I can make another call, would be really to all new uh, civil society organization to try to integrate clusters that already exist, whether it is a, a social welfare cluster, cluster looking at child protection, education, join the clusters because through the clusters you'll be able to know who are the other NGOs working in the same field as you. You'll be able to understand a bit better how local authorities also work so you don't find yourself duplicating you know, the same uh, initiative. And again, for private sector, um, it, you are basically giving to a community that's giving to you because you're getting your main power from that community uh, that you will be empowering. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrine. Uh, Tristan, over to you. 
Well, uh, b b b before I answer the question, I will somehow touch on what Bernard was saying about uh, the elders volunteering. When I was talking about our programs, I talked about something called an intergenerational dialogue mm. where, uh, on, our, on the history of Rwanda. So we have these, these, these people who, who know the history of Rwanda, who have been in, in, in different positions before, but who are now in retirement, who come to these intergenerational dialogues to, to somehow transfer the knowledge to the young people, to somehow transfer the memory to the young people, but most importantly, to transfer the resilience to the, to the next generation. So, because we should not only think about um, the older generation of, um, of, 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 of Rwandans as people who are just in their retirement, but as living libraries who can come in to the communities because they have more time to come to the communities, to come to talk to young people of my age because they're like, uh, I'm 23 and if I'm talking with someone who's like 63 or something of the kind, he talks about the history of Rwanda, the resilience of Rwandan people. So it really helps. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I think it's a good volunteering opportunity for, for the older generation. So coming back to, the, um, to, 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 to your question, I will, I will, I will somehow complement what uh, Deja Santin was saying. Um, we are starting to see more of the role of the private sector in, 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 in the activities we're having. For instance, uh, the hub I was talking about, uh, the Virashovoka hub, mentorship hub, that is going to be uh, in the first phase funded by the Embassy of Israel, will, will continue through the funding of different uh, uh, business leaders in, 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 in the Rwandan pr pr private sector. Actually, three weeks ago, we had a, a meeting with the CEO of PSF to talk about this initiative. I mean, how do we bring in these business leaders to come and inspire young people? But does, but, it, but it doesn't have to stop there. Mm -hmm. And then they inspire them, they, they, they mentor them, they, they, pass, uh, uh, they help them pass through the apprenticeship session. But then later, why not employ them? Why not employ these young people that were part of these mentorship hubs? So this is in a way of, 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 of trying to work and try to give a framework to the private sector to be able to give back to the community. And then, but, but, but the good thing is that one, they have been trained through the mentorship hub and then, and after the, the, the whole trainings, after the, the time they will spend in the mentorship hub, they, they are now going to, 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 to start the internships or the jobs uh, in the businesses of the people who have inspired them to, 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 to be working. So I think that's, um, Thank you. That, 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 that's somehow of, the, of, of what we are, we are trying to do with the private sector. Thank you very much. Um, definitely, you know, what I'm really getting is uh, we need there's a call on the private sector to just do a bit more. Um, I know, you know, you know we're growing as, a, as an economy, as a country, different priorities. Uh, but just listening to you, Tristan, listening to you, uh, Sandrine, um, it's really a call on the private sector to be more engaged, at least the CSR arm of, of most of these corporations, to be more engaged in, in philanthropy and volunteerism services in Rwanda. I'd like to just go quickly to our Twitter feed. Uh, we have some tweets coming in. Uh, just based on the conversation that we're having. Uh, the first tweet is from Hakim, and he says that, um, thank you, Dan, and the team again. Looking forward for a detailed breakdown and ex explanations on philanthropy and volunteerism from the guests with a comparison between developed and developing countries, hence what we can learn from those countries as youth. Um, I think we've had, we've had um, um, good uh, and tangible submissions from both our guests on this particular question. Uh, the next tweet coming in is from Paul who says, um, I like the run that we want initiative, very ambitious and a great aspirations instilling in youth today. No doubt for future prosperous Rwanda based on inclusive growth, volunteering spirit and sustainable development. Um, I think we have another tweet um, that's coming in. And um, I'd just like to tell our viewers to keep the tweets coming using hashtag uh, the square RW. Uh, but that said, I would like to uh, just go to the next part of the conversation, which is really closing remarks. Um, uh, sorry, we just have one more tweet coming in. And this tweet, if we can have this on our screen, says um, from Musana, says, thanks for bringing this. There is this idea that we wouldn't be a high income country without billionaires. Should we wait until 2050 to sensitize um, the upper class and, and the community to donate to national and noble causes? We need business entrepreneurs, but also social ones. Um, I think uh, Musana also echoes, Brenna, some of what you're saying in terms of um, you know, using the private sector to solve some of these social issues. Um, sort of the work that um, Imbutu and Rwanda We Want is doing. I'd like to just go to closing remarks from our guests. And um, in this, by this I mean uh, 
you know, the future. What do you envision um, for the future of the work that uh, not only Muta Foundation does, but Trist, um, Rhonda, we want as well? And um, I want to ask this question to Sandrine and then Tristan. Um, you know, looking forward, what do you envision for your institution, especially leaving behind a legacy for future generations to carry the work that you've been doing to carry it forward? Um, Sandrine, I'll address that question to you and then Tristan in a brief closing remarks. Thank you, Diana. Um, so how do we envision the future? We believe that the, the drive that was there 20 years ago of seeing um, uh, a community that was empowered, that was educated, that was healthy, will continue to drive the, the future of the foundation. But now as an organization, again, that's 20 years old, if you compare it to a human being, you are now in your young adulthood. So we are now thinking about looking at other organizations that are newer and younger than us and thinking about what kind of empowerment can we also share with them because we believe that for this ecosystem to be sustainable we can't leave all the initiatives to just one organization so it is our duty to share the knowledge that we have empower other organization to you know implement at the community level so we can move on to other strategic uh, responsibilities and as such what we will be doing is not only rising ourselves up, but also bringing everybody else with us in the process. Because we believe again that when we implement activities at the community level, we begin with already the end in mind, which is we do not want to be here forever. We want to have somebody else take over and own it the same level that Imbuto was owning it at the beginning. The other element for our future, and as I touched on that a little bit with um, the creation of a trust fund for more financial independence, the ability to support the causes that we believe are really uh, important and relevant to the development of the country again within the framework of the NST is to make sure that we understand how this ecosystem works. So meaning creating stronger uh, relationship with other organizations throughout Rwanda, but again, opening up our borders because again, we have the AFCFTA uh, that has been approved several years ago. We are now looking at what is our role at Imbuto Foundation to strengthen the South-South cooperation. What other organizations on the continent have the similar, uh, a similar objective or vision as Imbuto Foundation? What can we learn from them and what can we share in terms of best practices? Mm -hmm. So the future, I want to say, is bright. Uh, it's uh, ambitious but I don't think it's any more ambitious than it was uh, 20 years ago when Her Excellency and uh, her team went to work and said, we can do this even if not many people think that we can. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sandrine, and all the best with the event on Saturday celebrating 20 years of Imbuta Foundation. Um, I'd like to just hear closing remarks from Tristan you know, on the same question. What do you envision for the future of the Rwanda we want? Well, uh, we want, uh, Rwanda we want to continue empowering young people. We want, uh, Rwanda we want to continue helping young people to really unlock their potential because young Rwandans really have a great potential. And also we want Rwanda want to continue reminding uh, young Rwandans that there is uh, excellence in the Rwandan DNA and that that may be passed to the next generation and to the next generation again. So that's my dream for Rwanda want and I guess it is the same for everyone that uh, Rwanda want. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tristan. Uh, if you could have Sandrine and Tristan on our screens, uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure listening to both of you and you know all the best in uh, your initiatives and the work that you do. Uh, thank you, Tristan, and thank you, thank Sandrine. You. Uh, Brenna, Charles, uh, very brief closing remarks. Um, my final note is again to the private sector. Uh, responsibility is inherent with wealth. So we need the wealthy to manage um, their wealth through trusts, foundations to, you know, um, benefit the less fortunate in, in our society. Thank you. Briefly, uh, uh, just a very, very quick one again to do with private sector and Tristan uh, uh, alluded to this as well. Elsewhere, philanthropy is driven by motivation. Mm -hmm. Volunteerism is driven by motivation. Quite often it's around tax holidays and how you can write mm -hmm. off some of your, your profits and what have you. Mm -hmm. we, we sh we, if we want to drive the private sector to invest into a lot of these initiatives of Imbuto and the Rwanda we want and, and many others, let them be motivated to do that. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much, Charles, Brenna. Always a pleasure having you guys on board. Uh, to our viewers, thank you for your tweets. Uh, please keep them coming using hashtag the square RW. To our partners, Uzi Collections and Bourbon Coffee, thank you for always supporting the square. Have a good night. See you again next week. <laughs>